Okay, this is quick pattern recognition. All right, I guess start because you're, you're in the front row. Okay, layers of the eyelid. Uh, stem. Okay. Second. Uh, orbicularis. Okay. Tarsus. Uh, conch. All right, very good. So this you can see in skin. a cross section skin, orbicularis. Tarsus. Tarsus and conge and all right, let's talk sorry. <laughs> let's talk about some of the commonest entities that affect the eyelids. I guess we'll go Eileen. Um, what do we see here? Uh, we see a nodule uh, with some distortion of the lid margin. What's your differential in something like this? Okay, yeah, this is this is more acute. It's come on, it's painful, it's tender, it's acute. All right, so you think of a Chalazian, you can think of a, you know, Hordeolum or something like that. And so when we do the, we flip the lid over, we can see that sometimes these can occur internally, sometimes externally. And what's the classic path? Um, there's uh, fat and there's bony mountain flashes. And? Giant cells, exactly. So when you get a chalazian, <laughs> you see uh, lipogranulomatous inflammation. It's backup of fat, and then you see giant cells in there. Now, all these little evacuated spaces, those are not artifact. That's actually areas where there's lipid in there that is dissolved. Now, you'll, off you'll also see lymphocytes and plasma cells with these two. And then remember the differences between chalazia and hordeola. You know, hordeola can be infectious. And cysts, what's the most important thing if you have a cyst that you look at? Uh, the lining. The lining, exactly. So you want to look at the cyst linings. All right, this is the original Olympic Stadium in, well, not the original, the original modern <laughs> Olympic Stadium in <laughs> Athens. All right, so we're looking at eyelid tumors. Ashley, what are we suspicious of here? And what makes you suspicious? Um, the, you have the complete loss of the lid lashes. All right. Loss of lashes, elevated pearly borders with an ulcerated center. What is that characteristic of? Basal? 50-50 chance. Basal. Okay, good. And you said it with conviction. Good, good. So basal cells will often have these elevated pearly borders and they'll often have the ulcerated center. You want to be careful because you see that the lid margin is thickened all the way out to here, you've lost lashes, and so that's indicative of a tumor. And what's the classic findings when you look at a basal cell? So you see that the nuclei line up around the edge of each of the nodules. <coughs> you get the so-called palisading, and what's the most common type of basal cell? Nodular. So this is a nodular or nodular cystic. They can sometimes form cysts, but you see these multiple nodules of these tumor cells. What's the one you need to worry about? Um, oh, the one with the fingers. What's it called? I forget what it's called. Exactly. It's called morpheiform. And so that's one you need to worry about. So you see that there's little tiny fingers of the tumor cells, and in between them there's this desmoplastic reaction. There's this proliferation of connective tissue, and that's what makes these tough to remove because they can sneak out underneath and you don't, um, you know, you're not able to do it. What's the surgery you want to do if you have a morpheiform? Mose. Mose, exactly. And sometimes if you don't, you end up with this. So basal cell is a benign tumor, except when you let it grow for 10 years. So you don't want to let it grow for 10 years. All right, so just to confuse me, we've got Chris's squared here, so <laughs> just to make me confused. All right, so Chris the younger. Um, what do we see in here? Yeah, when you look at the, you look at it, it's got this kind of a parchment look to the surface of it. It's kind of the epithelium, it's got this parchment look, it's got a little bit of an orangish color to it, some keratin on there, and so this would be more of a squamous cell than a basal cell. And when you look at the squamous cells, what are these characteristic findings that we see here? 
worlds, and what are they made of? Uh, keratin. Keratin, exactly. So they've got these keratin worlds. Now, you don't have to take it this year, so you don't have to worry about this. You're just like going, yeah, whatever. I'll just see call patients. So you can see these keratin worlds and keratin pearls, and then you see that these cells are more active and they're more pink. You know, the basal cells are blue. If you're looking at a low power and you're not sure what it is, basal cells are blue, squamous cells tend to be more pink. And so you see that. Okay, Chris the Elder, what? Uh, um, so probably melanoma versus like a mucus. It looks like there's lash loss. I'd be more concerned about melanoma. Exactly. So you've got lash loss, you've got um, pigmented, bumpy, irregular, dark lesion. And when you look at the cells, sure enough, you see the nucleoli, you see the clumped chromatin. These aren't necessarily pigmented when you show it on the cells. And so this is a, a melanoma. You really worry about these because these can spread. All right, I can't even see who's behind the light back there. Okay, you can hear yeah. So what's the differentiation of a neva? Like as a neva ages, it goes from like junctional to, what's that process? Exactly. When the melanocytes come, come out from the neural crest, they go to the junction first. And so when you see a nevus originally, it will have some junctional component. And then eventually it can drop into the dermis or the subepithelial space and get a compound nevus. And then if it keeps maturing, you'll actually lose that junctional connection and just be left with a dermal nevus or subepithelial if you want to be technical. And once you've lost that junctional component, you lose the malignant capabilities. So that's important. All right, why would I be showing you this? Um, God, you got a small group today. Well, people must be feeling really conf confident about boards. Is this like a sebaceous brain carcinoma? Yeah, this is the classic masquerade syndrome they talk about, where it, it presents as a keratoconjunctivitis, um, conjunctivitis, if you will. And so people will often mistreat these as you know, inflammatory or as infectious. But if you look <coughs> carefully, Look at how thick the lid margin is. Look at the loss of lashes. And when you look at these pathologically, these are nasty, nasty actors. They're very aggressive looking. There's mitotic figures all over the place. Very, very aggressive looking tumor. And these behave very aggressively also. So don't miss it. Always keep your suspicion up for a meibomian gland, a sebaceous gland carcinoma. All right. So here. <laughs> Sorry, this is one I show to the students. They used to give me like four hours and then two hours. Now I do ophthalmic path in an hour for the students, and I had to cut out like half of it. So, and then the students always complain every year, eh, there's too much. It's like, well, shit, they give me an hour. What am I supposed to do? This is all you get. All right, so conjunctiva. So just, Eileen, tell me a little bit about the conjunctiva. What's the epithelium made of? Uh, Stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, keratinized or no? What are these little dots right here that you can see? Goblet cells, good. And so, remember just the basic parts of the conge. You've got the bulbar, fornicele, palpebral. What's the most common entity we see? Like Pinguecula. Pinguecula. I probably see this in 50% of my patients here in Utah. And then if it crosses the limbus? Pterygium. Pterygium. And what's the classic path findings? Solar and you can see here's a close up. Here's that smudgy gray basal field degeneration, ultraviolet light induced. And then when you get the little squiggly lines, that's the solar elastosis. All right, so tumors. Uh, Ashley, what would, be, what would we be concerned about here? Uh, our carcinoma in Yeah, you'd worry about it. Look at that picture gelatinous. And so they may show you a picture of a pterygium and then a picture of this to try to fool you. Now remember, pterygia, the epithelium is thin, and the tissue subepithelially becomes fibrotic and thickens, but when you're looking at tumors, the epithelium actually thickens, and so the tip-off here is this gelatinous look. It starts at the limbus, and it starts to grow, and you've got this gelatinous look right here, and when you look at this, what do we see in here? Okay. What else besides thickened? And uh, loss of keratinization. And then the uh, nucleal, uh, nucleal where I go all the way up to the. All right. To the 
So the nucleoli go to the surface, you've lost normal maturation, you've got nucleoli here, and now you remember this is conge, you're not supposed to have keratin. So, and in uh -oh. these you sometimes do get keratin, right. and that's the problem. So what would this be called? Three words, three words. Uh, or what, what we abbreviate as CIN. Conjunctival, intraepithelial, neoplasia. So CIN. And we rate it as mild, moderate, severe, depending on what percentage of the epithelium has been involved with the dysplastic cells. So mild is the lower third, moderate's two thirds, severe's more than two thirds. But by definition, the basement membrane is still intact. Now, when we're looking at this, um, Chris, what's different here from that previous lesion? <coughs> That's more white. What do we call it if we have a flat white lesion of the conch? Actually, it's called leukoplakia from the Greek. Leuko means white. Plakia, white plaque, so white plaque. So whitish plaque. What do you think that whitish stuff could be? Um, it's, uh, keratin type deal? it's keratin, good. So it is keratin. And so we're not dealing with, you know, um, African people with, you know, vitamin A deficiency. So that can give you keratinized little plaques on there too. But this is actually a, well, this is your day again. What is this? Worlds again, so this is a squamous cell CA, so it's gone from a CIN to squamous cell carcinoma, and you can see the worlds of these dysplastic squamous cells, and again, it can keratinize. And so remember, squamous cell carcinoma can also occur on the conge. All right, what do we see in here, other Chris? Uh, maybe some pigmentation near the limbus. Yeah, so. Is it worrisome? Yeah, it's kind of a regular, it's in a, it looks like a Caucasian, so I would say it's at least something to keep an eye on. Exactly, so you'd photograph this. If you look, it is flat. Yeah. It kind of looks like a dusting of pigment, and it's really not irregular, it's not growing. You take a picture of it. What if the path shows you this? Uh, so that would be PAM. PAM, which stands for? Uh, primary acquired melanocytosis. Just melanosis. Uh, Okay, so primary acquired melanosis, PAM, and again, we grade PAM as, as either with atypia or without atypia. So normal PAM, which is what you just saw, but you can even see it in just normal racial pigmentation, a line of benign melanocytes at the basal or layer of the epithelium here, no atypia, no extension up into the epithelium, but you can also have, like this, this is PAM with atypia, and if you look right here, this is more irregular, it's spotty, it's thickened, it's darker. So this is what you'd worry about now that this is becoming more atypical. And now you look, even though it's strictly within the epithelium, remember PAM's almost like CIN, it's like a tumor in situ, if you will, and so you see these melanocytes have become atypical, there's nucleoli, they're spreading up into the epithelium, and it's important to realize that PAM with atypia can lead to what? Melanoma. melanoma. So that's the pre-melanoma one, PAM with atypia. And sure enough, you know, they're not going to put this on boards because it's too easy. So pretty obvious that this is melanoma. So is it just PAM with atypia that has a 50% chance of becoming melanoma, or is it just all? Depends on the degree of atypia. Okay. It, the, the more atypia you have, the higher the chance. PAM without atypia has virtually zero degree. Okay. okay. And just remember, if you read a question on boards, read it real carefully, because 80% of melanomas arise from pre-existing PAM with atypia. But that doesn't mean that 80% of PAMs go on and form melanomas, and so don't, you know, flip those around. Be sure you keep that straight. And so here's your uh, melanoma that you've got. So melanoma, so, you know, about 80% of melanomas of the conj arise from PAM, about 15 to 20 percent arise from nevi. So can you just talk real quick about how you differentiate like a nevus from PAM? Yeah, PAM is strictly intraepithelial, where nevi will have a junctional component to it. So nevi will form nests okay. at the junction. 
So they can go into the substantia propria, they can go into the epithelium itself, they form these little round nests, whereas PAM will be individual cells that don't it. nest, they just line it up. No cysts clinically. What's that? No cysts clinically. No cysts clinically in, in PAM. All right, so again, we go, since I was talking about Greece, we go to the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis. All right, cornea. So, boy, easy one here. Reese, layers of the cornea. Uh, there's epithelium, Bowman's, uh, which is not a true basement membrane. Exactly. Uh, stroma, decimase, which is a true basement membrane, and then endothelium. And endothelium. All right, so that didn't count. That was too easy. So, this just shows you this is the basement membrane of the epithelium right here. Don't confuse Bowman's. Bowman's is not a basement membrane. Bowman's is a condensed anterior piece of stroma. And the endothelium, something we never see in the path lab, this is what endothelium looks like, because all we see is diseased corneas. See, there's endothelial cells on the inside of the cornea. You guys didn't <coughs> believe me that they really exist. All right, this is what, uh, I love these comics here. All right, so Eileen, corneal infections. What is this a classic picture of? Okay, and they may show you a picture of that, but the question won't be, what is this? The question will be a double level one. So you'll say, aha, I know this is a, you know, HSV. Then they'll ask you a question about, I don't know, subtyping or you know, what it does somewhere else. And so they love two part questions on boards, which I hate because you know the answer, but then the answer's not in the question, so. So would this person benefit from topical and oral antiviral therapy? Right, so that'd be the kind of question they would ask, exactly. And how do you treat this and what are the options? And so, you know, Know the party line, and but the key thing here is recognition. You see the little bulbous outpouchings that are coming along here, and they may ask you, you know, where are the viable virus cells? At the end of the bulb. Exactly, they're not in the center. That's just bare Bowman's layer or bare stroma. It's at the ends there where the active infection is going on. So when you look at it, you can actually get an ulceration where you will go. It'll go through Bowman's layer into the anterior stroma. What you worry about, though, is when the herpes goes deep, and they can ask you a lot of questions about deep herpes. Ashley, what are we seeing here? Exactly. This was actually one of my guys at Heinz VA in Chicago. You know, you just get these guys who wore contact lenses and. It was like, oh, it was really bad. And so this turned out to be a pseudomonas ulcer. So you worry about a bacterial ulcer. And why do you worry about it? It can cause a perforation. So there you see a white necrotic cornea. You see acute inflammatory cells here and an eventual perforation. So know the treatment you know, for um, corneal ulcers. Know what you do. Know how often you use them. They like to ask you that on boards. Okay, uh, Chris? So it looks like a pancreatia, hemosis, and conch, uh, uh, corneal infiltrate, which I hate to miss in the center. Um, so if you look around the infiltrate, look at how it's got that little halo around it. So this one's a little more indolent than the other one was. This one's been going on for a week or so. What could this be? Do bacteria usually smolder for a week? Um, no. What does though? What other bug can? Fungal. fungal, yeah, this is a fungal ulcer. Where are you from? Here. Oh, you're here from? Where? Uh, Utah. No, but where? <laughs> Provo. Provo, all right, so this here's a farmer from down there to Spanish Fark, you know, and, and he got something in his eye. So he comes up here finally, you know, two, two weeks later. This is a fungal ulcer. And this is a, one of our stains. Bonus points, because you weren't here for the stain lecture. What do we use to stain for fungi? Um, I don't know. You can say you don't know. That's fine. You can say you don't know. This is a GMS stain, Gamorium methenamine silver, and it stains the um, yeast silvery black. So that's yeast, a more indolent one. Okay, Chris, what are we seeing here? And I didn't have the fluorescein picture here, but what's going on here? Loss of the 
Exactly. So ring infiltrate, painful eye, loss of epithelium, what would you worry about? Acanthamoeba. And indeed, we do a, what kind of stain for acanthamoeba? Gridley. No, that's right. Gridley. So I said, I was, if I were ever in London, I'd have a butler named Gridley, you know? Gridley, bring tea. Yes, sir. So this is a Gridley stain. So Gridley stains it. It's uh, acanthamoeba. So you worry about it because these are really difficult to treat. Once they get along the nerves, they can actually spread to the sclera. These can be really tough to treat. So you got to recognize them early. And they may throw you a curveball and, and give you a history that sounds like chronic herpes. And it turns out it's acanthamoeba. So these are, these are tough to diagnose, tough to treat, okay? So we always just, just try to see if you guys are paying attention here, okay? So what's the difference between a G, like what does it look like, GMS versus GEMSA Um, I never use GEMSA stain, okay. so I have no idea what they okay. look like, but yeah. Looks like we always get tested on that for fungal too. Oh, okay. Now, corneal dystrophies. Um, let's see, back to Reese. Um, what dystrophy is this? Um, is this lattice? Lattice. Now remember, there's different layers of corneal dystrophies, but what's our mnemonic for the cornea stromal dystrophies that we have you guys memorize? Marilyn Monroe really always gets her man in LA County. Yes, exactly. And so that's how you remember your stromal dystrophies. So Marilyn? Okay, Monroe, eucopolysaccharide. Alshin blue. Alshin blue. Really. really. Recessive. Recessive, Alshin blue. Gets? Can I insult Eileen's because she interrupted mine? Yeah. Granular. Gets, uh, granular, her? Uh, Highland. Highland, man. Uh, Mason trichrome. trichrome. L? Uh, lattice. A? Amyloid, California, or uh, county? Congo Red. Congo Red, very good. So just know those. I don't have time to show you all of them. This happens to be a trichrome stain. So this would be what? Um, Hassan's trichrome stain. Mucopolysaccharide, exactly. All right, so just know those. What do we see in here, Chris? Looks like uh, Lyme Which one? Amyloid. Now, this is actually a retroillumination view. This is really deep, and you see they call this a beaten metal appearance. So it's got little dots on the inside surface of, of Destiny's memory, like someone took a little round hammer and just pounded it. And this is the pathology here. What are these little dots made of? What are they called? Fuchs. This is Fuchs. Fuchs. Fuchs dystrophy, and these are called guttata. So thickened decimase membrane, these guttata, loss of endothelial cells, so Fuchs dystrophy. What are we seeing right here, other Chris? This is Munson's Munson sign. And what is this characteristic of? Uh, keratoconus. Keratoconus. So you see the cone-shaped outpouching when the patient looks down. And what do we see on the path that, that we can call this keratoconus? First of all, is the cornea thin or thickened centrally? It's thin. Thin, and that includes epithelium and stroma. What's the classic finding we see? It's right here. You get these focal breaks or discontinuities in Bowman's layer. So some people would say this is even a Bowman's dystrophy, if you will. So the corneal epithelium stroma thin, you get these breaks here. You see posteriorly, the endothelium is normal. Right. So keratoconus. All right, what do we see in here, Adam? Uh, there is some bullous keratoconus. Exactly, so you see edema here, boi. What stain is this, and why would I use this? This is a PAS stain. PAS stain, and what is this right here? That is the true basement membrane of the epithelium. Yeah, so this Bowman you see does not stain. The basement membrane of the epithelium does stain, so you get Edema percolates through the stroma and then it'll gather 
in these basilar cells of the epithelium and then the cells will pop and you'll get this bulli, this big blister, so bullous keratopathy. All right, now I, I showed this to the medical students. So this is just Bardish, um, who was in the 16th century, said what you should, these are requisites to be an uh, oculist and a surgeon. And so my, my favorite ones here were to be, not to be a drunkard, not to be greedy for money or haughty, not to be presumptuous or vainglorious. And so by definition now, half of the people trying to become surgeons are, are like, you know, booted out there, so. <laughs> All right, this was my favorite one. Since I could not afford a high school and university education, I had to restrict myself to surgery. So sometimes I wonder about some of our surgeons who advertise a real lot. So this is Bardish's criteria. Okay, what are we looking at right here, Adam, again? This is the angle. Okay, trabecular mesh work. And so we don't have time to go over the layers here, but know your landmarks. They'll often show you sometimes collages of pictures of the angle. Some of them will be narrowed, some will be recessed, some will be closed off, and so know what your normal angle architecture looks like, and this is a schematic I do for the students. Um, back to Reese, what are we concerned about here on this patient? Um, I'd be worried for angle closure. Which eye? Right eye. Right eye. So what makes you worried here? Uh, the, there's an anterior, so the pupil on the right is more kind of in a mid eye mid dilated that eye is very red it's painful it's blurry and when you put the slit beam on there iris is both forward. all right so we call that iris bombay and so you see the iris bowing forward there so that's <coughs> indicative of uh, angle closure pupillary block glaucoma and what are we seeing right here um would that be pas it'd be a pas peripheral anterior sneaky there's the angle there and the iris is ending up stuck to the angle. Now, that can happen as chronic angle closure. What are other conditions that can lead to this? Um, neovascularization. Exactly, and if you look real carefully, look, there's a thin line of blood vessels right on there. So this is um, secondary angle closure due to neovascularization of the iris. Okay, now, know your glaucomatous optic cup changes because you definitely need to, need to know what they look like. And, you know, obviously we want to stop glaucoma before it gets to this 0.999 cup. But this is even more than that. It's excavated. It's a 1.1 cup. And so here's an end-stage glaucoma. You can see you've completely lost your nerve fiber layer. Here's the vessel diving around. That's why vessels disappear when they dive around the edge of the cup. They're literally going out to where it's cupped. And I like to say this because I went to school in Boston. This looks like a bean pot you know, the bean pot. So when you go to Boston and you speak at the New England Cataract Society meeting, they give you a silver bean pot as your kind of your speaker prize. And so you get this bean pot, it's the tradition. They make a big deal when they give it to you. So you get a bean pot from Boston. So think of Boston bean pot and stage glaucoma. All right, again, this is the famous five maidens that are on the temple on the side of the Acropolis there. Um, war and pollution has ravaged these. They've all been destroyed, the originals, so these are copies, so they couldn't save the originals. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the crystalline lens. Okay, what do we see in here, Eileen? Okay, which would uh, the most common entity be to cause this? It's superior temporal, so this is Marfan's. You can see the aphacic contact lens on the patient. So up and out is Marfan's, down and in is? Homocystine neuri. Homocystine I've never seen one before, but they're always on boards. And here's the Marfan's guy. All right, so now there's one other one you need to worry about. Um, there's, there's an entity where you can get a lens that will dislocate anteriorly. It's a small spherical lens. Wheel Marchesani, so you want to worry about that. And you can tell them apart if they ever ask you, because remember, Marfans are tall, spindly, you know, think Abraham Lincoln people. Wheel Marchesani are short, stubby people with short, stubby fingers and short, stubby lenses. Okay, so that's how you remember them. All right, so cataracts, you guys all know, they never ask anything about cataracts on boards, because of course, that's the most common thing you see in the most common surgery. Heaven forbid they ask that on boards. So this is a burnescent nucleus. Um, you know, you may see these in the third world or people who come from parts of Wyoming or, you know, Utah County. Um, 
So there's a brunescent nucleus. Here's a cortical nucleus seen from behind, Miyake view. And so this is my favorite one. We keep forgetting we do cataract surgery under topical anesthesia. So, you know me, I love to talk. And then we'll be in the room, and the residents will be saying, oh, well, did you see that game last night with Golden State? It's like, no, no, no. Like, you don't talk about that during surgery. Okay, you, you be serious because patients hear everything. So always make sure that they, you don't like be careful. Yeah, yeah, we added the name tag there. All right, here's the Acropolis at night. They don't let you go up there at night except once a year. So once a year, they let you go up there at night. All right, now, let's go to the other half of this lecture. Where is Hockenshire? That is Glacier. That's the top of, um, of Logan Pass if you go to Glacier in Montana, Glacier National Park. So if you've not been there, they've got it's called the, the Going to the Sun Highway. And you, just the highway goes all the way to the top and then down the other side. Beautiful, just beautiful. So let's keep our fingers crossed that this is actually going to work. Okay, here we go. All right, so retina. We're going to talk about retina. What is this? Macula in there. Okay, so since we only have 10 minutes, Know your layers. They're not going to ask you the layers, but you may need to know what it signifies if you have a hemorrhage in a particular layer and what it looks like. What is this? Fovea. Okay, so retinovascular diseases. This, this shows them up nicely. We'll just start over again. All right, Reese, what do we see in here? The sugar. <coughs> this guy got the sugars. Okay, what do we see in here? Nerve fiber hemorrhages. Okay, so they're shaped like a... Flame. The deeper hemorrhages dot are blot. dot blot. What are these guys here? Hardexates. What is this? Uh, cotton wool spot. Cotton wool spot. Exactly. So that kind of shows them all. And Eileen, what do we have here? Uh, Microaneurysms. Micro so this patient likely has uh, diabetic, diabetic retinopathy. retinopathy. And here we have right. massive heart exudate. We hopefully don't get to that point before we treat the patient. And here's what it looks like. Here's the exudate that's leaked out. You can see tremendous disruption of the retina from uh, diabetes. Ashley, what are we showing right here? Um, cotton wool spots. Cotton spots, and what are they? Um, infarctions of the nerve fiber. Exactly, so focal ischemic infarcts of the nerve fiber layer. So they're on the surface. They look like little wispy bits of, of cotton, so they'll block the vessels underneath them. All right, what do we see in here, Chris? Okay, of the, of the disc. disc, so NVD. This is the so-called Medusa's snakehead of the disc. And if we don't treat them, what happens? They bleed. And where is this bleed? It's like in the actual disc cavity. Well, so this is pre-retinal. It's in front of the retina, spilling out into between the retina and the vitreous, and you see the classic boat-shaped hemorrhage. Flat top, round bottom, boat-shaped hemorrhage. And if you don't treat diabetic retinopathy, you can get scarring, you can get traction retinal detachments, and so a lot of badness. All right, so here we have, this is the latest whoops ad, you know, <laughs> on the spot laser treatment. All right, so other Chris, I'll give you a hint, this patient's not a diabetic. Yeah, what else can look like this? You got exudates, flame hemorrhages, uh, maybe some, a little bit of obscuration of the disc. Uh, maybe like hypertensive. Yeah, so this is severe hypertensive retinopathy. It looks a lot like diabetic, but you can get disc edema. You can get this star-shaped exudate in the macula. So this is severe hypertensive retinopathy. And again, you got to treat it before it wipes out your retina. Adam, what do we see in here? Blood and thunder. Blood and thunder. And what causes this? Exactly. So this is central retinal vein occlusion. You can see that the hemorrhages go all the way out to the aura serrata. Again, could damage the entire inner two-thirds of the retina. What do we see in here, Reese? Uh, an artery occlusion. More specific? Uh, I'd say branch retinal. Exactly. Branch retinal artery occlusion. So it's white, it's ischemic, it's pale. And what do we see in here? Uh, this is more central. A central retinal artery occlusion. And what is this? Uh, and what causes that? Uh, choroidal flow. 
Yeah, so you can still see the choroidal flow in the center of the fovea shining through. And here you have, coming into the optic nerve, your central retinal artery, vein, they share a sheet, severe arterial sclerosis. Look at that fatty artery, lumen narrowed down. So you can get embolic phenomenon, central retinal artery occlusion, but you can get stasis next to it from that fat artery. So you get um, stasis and then a thrombus, so central retinal vein occlusion caused by arterial sclerosis. And there again is the damaged inner two-thirds of the retina. This is the Greek Parliament building and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I won't tell you my jokes about the guys who guard it, no time. What do we see in here, Eileen? Jusen. And what exactly are Jusen pathologically? Exactly, and because they're beneath the basement membrane of the RPE and on Brooks membranes, technically they're even called intra Brooks. And so you see these excrescences here, you lose the RPE overlying them, and what can happen eventually? Uh, you can have uh, bleeding from soil, bacteria. All right, so subretinal hemorrhage that's here, and this shows you that on fluorescein, and of course, if you don't treat it, you end up with this. Discoform scar, so this is a gliotic white scar that can form underneath there if you don't try it. All right, so what are the findings of retinitis pigmentosa? Bone spicules, arterial um, attenuation, scale disc. Okay, so waxy pallor of the disc, marked attenuation of the vessels, bony spicule pigment, and what exactly causes the bony spicule pigment pattern? Well, the, the RP is disrupted, but the, the little pigment granules get released, and they actually will deposit around the vessels. So they almost diffuse out and deposit. So that's why you get the bony spicule. It's outlining the vessels. All right, and this is my favorite one. We should do that with the lasers. Add the side effects. All right, so retinal detachments. Chris, what's the most common cause of retinal detachment? Uh, PVD, causing a hole and fluid All right, so we call it regmatogenous, meaning it's forming a tear. So here's a horseshoe tear, some kind of a vitreous traction. The tear forms. The fluid will go underneath it. You'll get a retinal detachment. Um, what is this right here? So it's a total detachment. You see it's attached here at the aura serrata and attached there at the disc, and so it forms what's called a funnel. So total retinal detachment forms a funnel, if you will. Okay, and here you can see a funnel-shaped detachment, exudative fluid underneath it. And when you try to repair a retinal detachment and it fails, you get failure due to proliferation of gliotic tissue, so this is called PVR proliferative vitreal retinopathy, and this is gliotic tissue growing here. This is a trichrome stain with gliotic tissue growing and pulling off the retina, so chronic retinal detachment. This is Delphi, where the oracle used to live. All right, optic nerve, normal optic nerve, normal optic nerve. Okay, papilledema. Other Chris, you've got to be really careful. What is the definition of papilledema? Exactly. So when you see a swollen disc, especially when you do oral boards, you don't say papilledema, you say a swollen disc. And then if they ask you for further information, you say, okay, if this were bilateral and the pressure were increased in the cerebral spinal fluid, we would call it papilledema. So you see the classic findings, flame hemorrhage, engorged vessels, swollen, elevated disc. We look at the path, there's the swollen disc, there is the engorged vessels, there's the hemorrhages. Okay, and this is my, my favorite. I love on television when they've got like a gallery where people look, never seen that ever, except in Moscow. Fyodorov's operating room had a gallery where people would stand up there and watch him operate. It also had a um, assembly line underneath, so they would do the cataract in like six stages on an assembly line. Yeah, very interesting. All right, so here's the glaucomatous disc. We already looked at that. All right, so this is from two weeks ago. Optic nerve tumors. Adam, young 10 year old little girl. Yeah, she's got, uh, she's got some amicicoria. 
Anna Sicoria, and she's got some. All right, so this is the left eye. She's actually got some proptosis there also, some inferior displacement. We look at her scan, we see that. What is that characteristic of? Like a glioma. Glioma, so a tumor arising from the optic nerve itself. Here's the glioma. What is this structure? Eosinophilic staining material in the cytoplasm. It's called a Rosenthal fiber, and they may ask you this. So remember, optic nerve gliomas are simply grade one astrocytomas. They're the lowest grade, grade one astrocytomas. Some people would even call them a hematoma. They would say it's not really a tumor. And they occur in kids, as opposed to this nice little old lady. And Reese, what's that? Uh, Optocillary shunt. So that's a sign of slow squeezing, so something growing slowly around the disc. Now that could be signs of other things too. Central retinal vein occlusion can give you an optociliary shunt. What's the epinephrine for the triad here? For like meningioma? Don't know the eponym, sorry. Got me there. Spencer's triad. Spencer's triad. Well, that's a new one. Didn't know that existed. So see you run up what on me. Optociliary shunts, optic atrophy, and optic nerve meningioma. Wow, didn't know that. That's not in there, so don't waste neurons memorizing that. I've never seen that show up on an exam. So here's the classic finding. What do we see on an MRI scan here? Tram track. So you see the tumors in the middle, and you've got wires on the other side, a tram track sign. And Eileen, what are the classic? Some MoMA bodies, these little concentric calcific bodies that form in a meningioma. All right, so we're almost there, the daydream alert. Okay, so we just went over this a week ago, retinoblastomas. What is this material, um, Ashley? Calcium, so you see the viable tumor cells, necrosis, calcification. What are these guys called, Chris? Nope. Very specific, they may ask you this. Named after two people, German. These are Flexner, Wintersteiner, Rosettes. Classic for retinoblastoma, Flexner, Wintersteiner, Rosettes. Other, Chris, when retinoblastoma spread from the eye, how do they spread? Uh, through the optic nerve. Through the optic nerve. So you can see it right there. All right, and this is what happens when you don't treat them. All right, so again, we're almost Almost done. You'll have to have put earplugs in now so all this doesn't run out of your brain. All right, malignant melanomas. We talked about this. What is this shape, Adam? Mushroom shape. The mushroom shape. All right, so what, who's the guy who described the cellular classification? Calendar. Calendar. So this is spindle A, epithelioid, spindle B mixed with epithelioid, a mixed tumor. How do they spread? Scleral emissaria. Here's a vortex vein. Here's the tumor spreading. And where do they go when they spread? The liver. The liver. All right. This is Delphi and enough. Okay. Good luck on boards, guys. Bye.